binomial probability. Okay. First of all, let's discuss what we can use this for. Binomial probability is a way that we can, and I'll, I'll read this and then explain it. We can use binomial probability to calculate the probability of the number of successes in an experiment for which there's a fixed number of trials. So, it, and what I'm talking about here is, um, let's do an experiment where I toss a coin a hundred times. So there's a hundred trials of that ex in that experiment, and each time I could calculate what's the chance of getting a head, what's the chance of getting, say, 60 heads. So calculate the probability of the number of successes. So I would say, in this experiment, I want to say a head is a success and a, and a tail is a failure. And then, but we'll see this more in the example. So can we, we can use the prob binomial probability to calculate the probability of the number of successes in an experiment experiment for which there is a fixed number of trials, like tossing a coin a hundred times. So each outcome is either a success or a failure. So that's like getting a head, or a, we'll call a head a success and a tail a failure, if we're interested in heads. If we're interested in tails, then we could call tails a success and heads a failure. And these are complementary events. What I mean by that is, if you don't get a head, you get a tail. So those two events cover everything. When you add up the probability of getting a head and the probability of getting a tail, you'll see that it's one, because you must get one or the other. And these are complementary events, so you either get one or the other. And it's written here. The probability of a success, we will figure that out, and we'll call it P is the same for each trial. So tossing a coin every time the, the probability is one half. Uh, rolling a die every time the probability of, say, getting a six is one over six. And then the probability of failing to do this would be one minus p, uh, one minus that probability. So probability of getting a head is one, uh, it's one half. Probability of getting a, a tail must be one minus that. One minus a half is a half. So that works. Um, so let me show you an example of this, and it might become clearer what this, is, what this actually can work, what we can figure out with this. Okay, what's the probability of getting exactly two fives when you roll four dice? Okay, so we have to think of this. Can this be um, interpreted as an experiment? where you have a fixed number of trials, n, and you have, um, you're interested in either success or failure, and the probability of each success is the same, okay, and the, the, the failure is also the same. So, let's have a look at this. Yes, I would say it is a fixed number of trials because you're rolling four dice. So let's say that's four, um, four trials. Okay. So my n is four. The outcome for each of those dies to get um, a five. What's the outcome of getting a? What's the probability of getting a five on a die? What do we think? What's the probability of getting a five on a die? What's the probability of rolling a five on one die? Good. I seem to have lost some people. This will become more evident in a minute. Okay. The probability of getting a five is one six. So what I'm going to say is, in this experiment, I'm going to roll four dice. So I'm going to do four trials. I'm going to say, success is when I get a five and the probability of success is 1 over 6. So let's see how this, what I wrote down here. So it's a fixed number of trials, it's 4. Okay, so it, we have to make sure it fits the binomial probability um, and how that's set up. So it's a fixed number of trials is 4. 
each outcome you, you either get a 5 on the die or you don't get a 5 so we kind of have to set it up to be uh, think about success and failure the outcome, the chances of a success is 1 over 6 and the chances of failure on each trial is 5 over 6 so that's all we need to do we need once, and then all I'm going to do next is put it into a formula and get the answer. So, as long as we can look at the question, we can decide that you're doing a fixed number of trials, like tossing a coin a hundred times, and that every time you do this trial, the probability is the same for getting a success. In this case, we're talking about getting a five. That's a success. Not getting a 5 is a failure, um, so we have these fixed probabilities, 1, 6, and then the probability of not getting a 5 is 1 minus 1 over 6, 5, 6. Right, same example. So what's the probability of getting exactly two fives when you roll four dice? The number of trials is four, four dice. Each outcome you either get a 5 or you don't. So that's success and failure. We're interested in two fives. So we're interested in um, two successes. The probability of getting five is one over six. The probability of not is five over six. So we're going to use the formula. And the formula may look a bit complicated because it's got combination in it. All you need to do is you need to know n, which is the number of trials, um, r, which is the number of successes you're looking at, so that, that would actually be 2, because you want two fives, and then the probability of a success, I wrote that probably wrong, didn't I? Okay, it's, let me just, there was a, there's a misprint there, that should say, be copying that right down, that should say P. 1 minus P. So we've got our P, we've got the probability that which is 1 over 6. 1 minus P is 5 over 6, and then N minus R. So we have all those things. Let's, let's spell them out for you. Okay. So in this, in this question, what's the probability of getting exactly 5? Five? 2 fives when you roll 4 dice. It's, there are four trials, because you've got four dice being rolled. You've got two successes, because you're interested in getting two fives. The probability of getting a five is one over six. So all I need to do is put it into this formula. Now, you remember what um, the com how the combination works? Uh, my combination is a formula and you may have this on your scientific calculator, probably do, but you can also remember the factorials. It's this formula. All you need to do is know N and R and you've got it. R is, yeah, R is the number of successes. So in this case R is 2. So we want to get exactly two fives. So let's put the numbers in here uh, and you'll see how this works. So um, exactly two fives. My n is four. That's the number of trials. My r is two. The number of successes. Two fives. My probability of getting a success, meaning a five, is one over six. And I raise and the power here is the number of successes. So the probability of getting a success is one over six. And Correct that over here. But that should be an exclamation mark there. And my two comes from my R, which is the number of successes. That's there. The next bit of the formula looks like this. It's one minus P, which I corrected here. One minus P, which is five over six. And then you just have to put N 
n minus r, well n is 2, uh, sorry, n is 4, 4 are dice, 4 trials, and 2 is the number of successes. So then put those numbers in. I did the combination for you uh, because I just did it on a calculator, you can use the formula. Uh, the combination comes out to be 6. 1 over 6 to the power 2. Um, we just raise 1 to the power 2 and 6 to the power 2, we get 1 over 36. 5 over 6 to the power 2. 5 to the power 2 is 25. 6 to the power 2 is 36. So there we have it. Um, we just need to multiply across for fractions. Remember 6 can be expressed as 6 over 1. Well, that's not right. I forgot my 6, didn't I? Okay, let me correct that. Because I wrote 6 there. I can see that the answer is wrong. Um, 6 times 25, 150. So the actual answer here is not that. I can see the, there's a mistake there. 6 times 25, 150. And maybe it is right. Maybe I simplified as well. 36 and 36. Yes, I simplified at the same time. Um, multiplying across, you would get this, and then simplifying, you would get 25 over 216. So it was correct. Okay, it just I just expected it to be 150 on the top. Okay, so that's uh, the probability of getting exactly 25. We're going to do another example. Okay, and again, I don't know why I made a mistake on that formula, but I'm going to correct it right now. That should say P, and now that formula is correct. Okay, so this example, 23% of new cars sold last year were black. Okay, we asked eight people who bought cars last year at random if the car they bought was black. Okay. What's the probability that exactly two of them bought black cars? So we have to think um, about does it fit the model of a binomial probability? Do we have a number of trials that took place? Do we have a number of successes? And do we have the probability of a success? So eight people bought cars last year. Okay. Um, what we want to do is ask them, we want to know how many bought black cars. So let's think about black cars being a success and anything but a black car being a failure. So those would be complementary events. So we have to think about number of successes. What do you think the number of trials is in this one? What's our n going to be? Someone tell me what n is going to be? Yeah, good. Got two good answers. Um, not 6. Not 23. The number of trials. Okay, good. Um, most of you getting it right. The number of trials is 8 because we asked 8 people and those eight people could say, um, yes, I bought a black car, and no, I didn't buy a black car. So the number of trials is eight, because we're asking it eight times. What's the uh, number of successes that we're interested in? Read the question, what's the probability that exactly two of them are black cars? So what's the number of successes? Good, two. Yeah, everyone's getting that, that's two. And then what's the probability of getting, what's the probability of a success? So think about just doing it one, this one time. If you ask someone if their car was, they bought, they bought was black or not, what's the probability that it was black? Do we know that? Do we know what the probability that it was black? The 
look at that number there. We haven't used that number yet. Good, that's great. It's the probability that it's black is 23%, 23 over 100 if you want. And if you express it as a as a decimal, it's going to be 0 0.23. So our P, we can say, we can express that as a decimal, 0 0.23. Okay, so let's have a look at this. My N is 8, because I asked 8 times. My success is I'm interested in is 2. How many bought 2 black cars? How many bought black cars? 2. And our probability is 0.23. All I need to do now is correctly put these numbers into my... The number that bought exactly 2 cars is... Sorry exactly two bought black cars, the probability of that is put the all the numbers into here, I'll show you all put my n in where the uh, combination is so that's going to be 8, uh, the r is 2 my probability is 0.23 my number of trials is 2 then I have 1 minus 0.23 which is 0.77 and then I have 8 minus 2, which gives me 6. So that's all the numbers I need. I just need to figure that out, put it in the calculator, and the probability is 0 0.3087. So it's a bit less than a third. And that's how we work that out. Okay, so that's binomial probability. You probably need to read a bit more about that and practice that. Let me just have a look at the last lesson, which is, so I have to speed this up a little bit because of time. Making predictions. Okay. To try to determine the probability of an event, we can conduct experiments. We know that because we've been, you can toss coins or whatever. When we conduct a number of independent trials, so let's say N independent trials, the experimental probability of the event is it's given by this. So the probability of an event is the number of times that that thing occurred divided by the number of trials. It's like tossing the coin a hundred times. Uh, you'd hope to, if you got um, 51 heads, you would say the number of times that heads occurred was 51 and the number of trials was 100. So our experimental probability would be 0.51. So, here's another example. If we want to determine the probability of getting ahead on a damaged penny, I'm saying it's a damaged penny because it, it won't toss the same as a, a, as a, a, a fair penny. We could toss it a hundred times. If we got 20 heads in this experiment, then the probability of getting ahead would be 20 the time, the number of times we got that event divided by 100 the number of trials so that simplifies to 1 over 5 this is a very biased penny and you wouldn't want to um, you wouldn't want to have a um, you wouldn't want to use it really so you can do an experimental probability and here they have the law of large numbers which kind of is fairly obvious um, the more trials you do, the more accurate the prediction becomes. So if I toss the coin a fat a thousand times, um, I would get a, a more accurate uh, assessment of what the true probability is than if I just did it five times. And again, I'm just going to look at the number of times the event occurred by divided by the number of trials. Okay, there's a couple of questions I'm going to look at here. The first one, making predictions. So, I have a graph. It shows data about a class grade, about the class's grade. So, students uh, on four tests scored different grades. We just counted the number of grades that they got, and we made a chart. There's 30 students in the class. Predict the number of Cs on the next 10 tests. That's our question. Predict the number of C's on the next 10 tests. What we have here 
we have our experimental data. So we know that we can add up the number of trials by adding all those numbers. And then if we're interested in C's, we can see how many C's were scored. Now, um, so the first question is, let's do this in step. The first question is, what's the probability of a student getting a C? So first of all, you have to add these numbers up to know how many, um, how many trials. And then you have to look at how many C's were scored. And that will give you the probability. Has anybody got that answer? What's the probability of a student getting a C? Good. That's a good answer. Not 50%. So you have to actually look at the data. The data that was given is in this chart and you have to look at it and you have to figure out, okay, well, 60 Cs, how many trials took place? Okay, well, I may go a few minutes over, but let's have a look at this. The answer is 60 because we had, a, we had 131 trials because that's, if you add all these numbers up, there's 131. 60 of them were C's. So then we just have to say, well, how many C's would you expect on the next test? There's 30 students. Each has the probability of 60 over 131. So then you just have to multiply those together. Sixty over one thirty one times thirty, that would be the the number of C's you would expect on the next test. How many on the next ten tests? Obviously ten tests, there's uh, gonna be ten times that many. So there we have it. Um, sixty over one thirty one is my probability of getting a C. I've got thirty students and I've got 10 tests. I just multiply them together and I don't give the answer as 137.4. Why not? Because it's going to be have to be given as a whole number, so I'm going to round it, round to 137. So how many C's would I expect on the next 10 tests? 137. Given that the probability of getting a C is 60 over 131 and we have 30 students and we have 10 tests. Hundred and thirty one is all these is these added up. If you add eighteen plus forty five plus sixty plus six plus two, it adds up to one hundred and thirty one. I know that four times thirty does not give you one hundred and thirty one, but that that doesn't really matter. If some students may um, this is the data that was presented. The student the class may not have been thirty in the past. We have our experimental data. This is this is actually from the book, so um, you have to take it as you do have to count this data and figure it out. Okay, so what I've got, I've got eleven o'clock. That's our finishing time, and I've got one more example, which is a, a question that's very similar to one on the quiz, and I've got the phrase that pays. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you the phrase that pays and then I'm going to come back to this example. Now I know that there's two on the quiz for this last lesson that are very similar to this example. So here's the phrase that pays for those of you who really have to go at 11. Okay. So for the phrase that pays I want you to write down the session number or the date and the phrase itself. Remember study island extra credit. Not a very complicated phrase. Remember, study island extra credit. That's my phrase. And I want you to submit that to the Dropbox. Uh, the Dropbox called phrase that pays. Uh, I'll go back to that example, which, has, which um, is similar to a couple on the, um, the quiz for that lesson. And once you understand it, it's very straightforward. So if you just read the question, it might be quite kind of puzzling. So. I'm going to give you a second or two. 
and this is it. I'm going to circle it. Remember Study Island, extra credit. This is the phrase that pays. Try to make it as clear as possible. It's this. How much is it worth? Worth three points. Okay. And you would get another two points if you wait and understand the next example because I know there's two questions on it on one of the quizzes. Not the same question but very similar. So this is three points. The understanding of the next example will get you another two points. Okay. Remember study island extra credit. I'm going to go back to my other example so we can get see if we can do it in about three minutes. Okay. Making predictions. It's estimated that 9% of people have a particular genetic defect. A screening test is 80.2% accurate for people that have the defect and 92.8% accurate for people who do not have it. Astrid tests 400 people for the defect. Now, um, sounds like a complicated question. But what you need to do is you need to break it down and think about it. What we have, we have 400, let me get my pointer, we have 400 people. And we know that 9% of those 400 have a particular genetic defect. So people either have the defect or they don't have the defect. Okay? And we know that that's 9%. What's the, what percentage do you think I should write down here for not having the defect? Yes, 91. Okay, because you either have it or you don't. So I've written down here, uh, oops, I've written down here 91. So you can do that. And then now that we know that we have, we're now looking at this next line. You either have the defect or you don't. Okay, well let's think about if you have the defect and look back at the question. It says a screening test is 80.2% accurate for people that have the defect. Okay, so here's my 80.2. So these people have the defect and they are identified correctly as having it. That's what it means by it's accurate for people that have the defect. So you have to kind of understand that. So you have the defect and it's identified correctly. What percentage have the defect and they're not identified correctly? Good? Good? Getting a good answer there. What percentage are not identified correctly? Obviously you either are identified correctly or you're not. So Let's unveil this one. Good. That must be 19.8%. So now we're trying to we're building up our, our tree. Let's have a look at the rest of the question. It says, um, and looking here, and 92.8 accurate for people who do not have it. So now we're looking at the people who have no defect. 92.8. Um, have no defect and are identified correctly as having no defect. Okay. So the other one, this percentage here, that you don't have the defect, uh, but they go and tell you that you do because they're not identifying it correctly, or they're saying we can't identify it, must be, everyone's getting it, that's good, it must be 7.2%. Okay. So now we have it. We can work out everything we want to know. Um, the question here was, if you have a look, how many have the defect and are identified as not having it? So we are interested in they have the defect and they are identified as not having it. So we're interested in that number. Let's show you how you work this out. Um, the number that have the defect, it's just well, we know there's 400 people, 
so it's 9% of that so that's 36 the number that don't have the defect is 91% of 400 which is 364 then we go on to the next level we've now got 36 that have the defect of those 80.2% are identified correctly so multiply 36 by 80.2 and you get 28.9 and obviously um, this number down here will be 36 minus 28.9 or I could just say 36 times 19.8% and I will get this number 7.1 I have to round it to 7 okay so the question asks how many have the defect and identified as not having it the answer is 7 um, I can also so my answer was 7 I can also work out if you asked any of these other ones I can go well okay there's 364 that don't have the defect um, the ones that don't have the defect and are identified correctly is this number multiply it by 92.8% and then those that don't have the defect and unfortunately when they, deter they get told that they have the defect which is not that nice is this number 26 so there are similar questions on the quiz to this so the easiest way is to draw a tree try and put everything that's in the question on that tree and try and work out the percentages and everything and you should be able to do it okay and are there any questions on that or anything else that we've done today I can put the slides on Rome if you don't have any questions um, you're free to go I know we're over time So thanks and bye to any, anybody that's leaving now and have a good day. You can roam on the slides so you can go back and look at the last examples. They aren't on roam. Okay. Well, the answer to that one, the answer to this one making predictions was that. Okay. Oh yes, I do have it for the moderator. Thanks. Yes, they're on Rome now. Definitely on Rome.